Okay. Uh, uh, welcome to the Super Best Friends cast. No, they're dead. <laughs> you oh yeah. shit, you're you, right. You they can't died. I mock forgot. the dead. That's fucked no, up. Uh, welcome to the Whataburger cast. Pour one out for the boys. I'm your host, Watt. And I'm Ah. Uh, and I'm Berg. Anyways, welcome to the Roundabout cast. Oh, that's um, what we are, yeah. Today we're missing our special guest, Tyler. He's he's pretty busy. Uh, may or may not be busy next week, but we'll we'll kidnap him soon enough. We'll figure it out. Bring him yeah. back for his lovely opinions. Uh, I'm your host, Willer. I'm special boy Bradley. I'm I'm regular boy Joe. <laughs> that's cor- all. Of th- that's all correct. Okay. All right. Uh, as usual, I should remind people to uh, comment, like, subscribe. <laughs> but but no, really. Uh, rate our shit if you're listening to this. Uh, you can give us like a three star. That's cool. Don't go lower though, because then my feelings will get hurt. If you um, don't rate us, I'm gonna know, and I'll I'll, I'll come get you. He will. Uh, review us on Yelp. Yeah, <laughs> on I don't Yelp. know. If, I don't know why we would be on Yelp, but. Uh, uh, Roundabout cast has great food. <laughs> we the grilled chicken was a bit dry. Mm. Um, we're also on iTunes and uh, Google Play and YouTube, where you can also find segmented videos of certain it's, topics. It's very convenient if you know we talk about a lot of things in a particular podcast, and um, if you're only there for one thing, that's okay. And uh, Willer has conveniently split it up for people who are there to listen to a particular topic please don't let my suffering go to waste thank you (laughs) um speaking of a lot of topics we actually have a lot of topics to talk about today they're all going to be mostly quickies no big hour and a half segments like last week's marvel bonanza yeah it's kind of the opposite of last week so going into that we're going to get into the first topic which is going to be i'm going to talk about game of thrones which I'm up the, to date, so I'm gonna big boy. navigate around spoilers. But then Joe's gonna talk about Game of Thrones. Yeah, I'm not. Well, be- <laughs> you kind of should, because I think Bradley will one day enjoy Game of Thrones. So I will one day well, join in the. Uh, I will. The crew. I will. I will. I will say things. That's about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, they're cool. They're cool things. But tell us how this finale season is going, Willer. So, last time I talked about Game of Thrones was two episodes ago, um, which was episode two of the season. Episode three was the most hyped up episode of probably the series. Uh, that's not an understatement. Um, and a series with as much hype as Game of Thrones, it's like the most hyped TV series maybe ever. Yeah, it's, um, that's saying something. Right, so that means that episode had tremendous hype. Um, that episode, as I watched it, it was okay, and then I thought about it, and then I thought about it, and I hate that episode. <laughs> that, I've heard that sentiment thrown around. <laughs> it's a borderline series ruining in some cases. Jesus, the the, the battle episode. Yes. Okay. Weird, wow. right? Yeah. Right. Well, you'll you'll know more when you get there. Joe's currently in season five. Um. That being said, I'm not one to dismiss the entire series because of something like that, right? Yeah, like so, it's been a cultural phenomenon. So I mean, and there's like still, I'm, I'm sure everything else is still worth watching. It's still good. I, I know some people like this salted the earth for some people. I have friends. I've seen opinions online where they're like, I don't know about these last three episodes because that episode was so crushing to almost mm. everyone I know. Um, Damn. And uh, one day we'll talk more about it when we're all caught up. But I. Being the optimist, I liked episode one and two, um, so I went into four, like, okay, we're going to move on to something different now, but I think it's going to get more back to the better parts of Game of Thrones now, Yeah. Um, and I think it did. Um, I actually really like this episode. Um, there's some theories floating around because of it that have got me really hyped. Um, there was one really, really stupid scene where... It was pretty bad, and you know, people watch that scene and they get pissed off and they hate the whole episode now. I, that's kind of something that I feel like Bradley sometimes falls prey to, where something really yeah. dumb happens and like. Is this the Starbucks? No, <laughs> the Starbucks is fine. 
But there's two kinds of people. One, There's the kinds of people where, like, a really dumb thing happens and it kind of invalidates that whole episode or that, like, it kind of brings down that JoJo arc, which is where this came up um, before. It brings it down by a lot because of, like, one big crucial dumb thing. I think yeah. me, me and Joe are a little more optimistic where we're like, yeah, that was really dumb. But you know what? There was other good things in the episode. Yeah, sometimes I'll be like, man, that was a really good arc. But if this one thing was gone, I'd be like, man, that was amazing. Yeah. So I know what you're talking about. Never know what that will be. You yeah. never know. Bradley never know. is very unpredictable. Beast. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have like a whole thing where we're trying to dissect and understand Bradley. So th- this podcast is a helping piece to that they're building a database oh yeah <laughs> there's a certain database of yours our, our goal is just to learn. find something we can recommend to brad and be 100 percent certain he'd like so far it's been a 75 20 i, I had breaking bad breaking bad is that was, uh true. that was the most surefire thing in existence i didn't know how fast he would like it though because from episode one he already loved it oh dude so, like one minute in <laughs> we'll talk about breaking dad at a yeah, it actually was yeah like, game of thrones <laughs> that's why we're here um yeah. uh don't want to spend too much more time on it i really liked episode four um so there's dumb writing happening with some plot things but i'm the kind of person where I tend to lean characters over plot. Not that, like, if there's good characters and bad plot, doesn't necessarily I mean like the thing. If there's bad plot, if there's good plot and bad characters, it doesn't necessarily mean I'll dislike it. I just tend to lean character writing. Yeah. And I feel like all the characters are getting really good finales to their arcs this season. Uh, the writing for all of them is still consistent. Um, it's, like, it's the reason why I really like Lost as a series, which will kind of crucify my opinions to anyone. But Lost plot gets fucking nutty, which it, there's a certain enjoyment to that, actually. But the character writings and the plot twists that feed into the character development are really well written, and they're really real. So, yeah. Uh, I'm still looking forward to these last two episodes, and I like this most recent one. Next episode, I think, will be a battle that's even better well, I mean, isn't next episode essentially the episode nine of this season? Yeah, it's five. It's episode five out of six is next. Yeah, so this is this is the episode. It's essentially the, the Gen- climax episode. Generally, yeah. nine is the climax of every season. That's correct. Yeah. In season five, it was eight, but um, I'm generally speaking, I think I'm on six. Ooh, Joe, you got some good stuff coming. Um, yeah. Despite me not liking season five, it has one of the best episodes. So just real quick, let me semi spoil a thing. There was a yeah. s- the the bad scene that everyone hates involves um, one of the main characters being really dumb, and there's like director uh, interviews after the episodes, and they're like, "Yeah, she forgot that her main threat existed for a moment." Like, oh, God. <laughs> it's that like, like what. The, the writers, the director said this themselves. He's like, this character forgot the biggest threat that is going on in the plot to her at this moment. Like, say you're going into a battle. She forgot the most, the baddest, biggest unit. I forgot about the dragon in the sky. Like, no. There's something it's... happening in the moment where she No. Could... <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> It's it was wild. It was uh yeah, I can see why people are kind of mad at Jesus, that. Jesus, it's raining hard outside. <laughs> yes, it is. Me and Bradley live in the same city and uh we're going to get Noah's Ark in a second here. So we got <laughs> So we the, might get cut off in the goes. middle of this. If the power goes down, that might be real bad. <laughs> yeah. oh. Um okay. That's that's my Game of Thrones session. That was a uh, nice and quick. We're going to yeah. move on to Joe. Joe, I want you to tell me yeah. your thoughts on seasons 1 through 5 and a half. Okay. Well, seasons four and a half. Um, well, whatever. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to preface this with I read the first two and a half books of A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, I really liked those books. Like, I I really liked uh, Game of Thrones, the book. Um, I really really like Clash of Clans, <laughs> Clash of Kings. Um. Uh, Clash of Kings is one of the best like fantasy fictions I've ever read. It's it's so good in a way that it presents the different, um, just the different like houses and how they interact with each other and the politics and it really, um, it there's a lot of nuance in the writing and the events that happen and, you, and there's a lot of foreshadowing in these books. 
Um, I've also I watched up to season four, second episode. Uh, <laughs> That's a good Game fucking Thrones episode. Before I, before I stopped, um, for a very variety of reasons. Uh, the main one being is that uh, we we just decided to disconnect HBO, and I was like, oh okay, I guess I won't finish Game of Thrones then or keep up with it. Rip. And we've gotten it back, so now I'm kind of watching everything again. Um, so let's let's see. Season one, I I really like season one. I didn't necessarily like the second go around, uh, mainly because I've already seen it, and I feel like a lot of that season hinges on you believing Ned Stark is the protagonist of the series. Yeah. Um, um, I actually liked so, season one better the second go around because I got to. There was a lot of characters, so I I got to. There are a lot of characters. Yeah, um, I got to see some stuff, and, uh, some foreshadowing, which was nice. But yeah, yeah. Uh, which is which is fine. I still like it. I still give it a five out of five. Uh, hey. Season two, I still really like season two, um, because I think it does a really good job of showing Tyrion and his relationship to his family. And kind of really buckling down on that and the politics that goes on within this uh, kingdom. Because you really didn't see that in season one, like hand to the king and stuff. Because mm-hmm. that it was too busy trying to figure out what the hell is going on with John Aaron. Yes. Big plots. Um, so season three rolls around. And season three has one of the most infamous like episodes and scenes of all of Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Maybe um, television, like it, it was. It maybe, got maybe people television. going. Uh, the problem being is that the people that are involved in the that scene, I really did not care about. Hmm. And I felt I felt that way the first go around. I felt that way when I was reading the books. I just that was a plot line. I really just didn't care for okay i could yeah i could see i I liked them a lot and a lot of the fan base did but i can see if you weren't if you didn't care about that plot line which was that plot line was the main part i would say of season three so oh no i agree and that's why i kind of like i I don't like season three as much is because it focuses Mm -hmm. on that plot line that's fair um the other one being is like i think uh daenerys targaryen is really good in season one she has a terrific arc um it's it's absolutely fantastic in the books uh but then season two and three, I'm just kind of like, I don't uh, just because uh, see, especially season three. Season three, it feels like yeah. she's just getting handed stuff, and you're just like, Whoa. now the a part of that though is like, there there's a meta story I guess around Daenerys' story where she's kind of destined for greatness, you know, um, right? And, and I she that, believes but... it, and it, it's one of those things where it's like belief is leading to results as well. No, I and, and I get that. It's just like comparatively to like season one, where you have this girl that is literally sold off into essentially like like slavery and. Mm-hmm. And like abused and whatever, and has to grow to be this strong, independent woman. And you kind of, and then the next two seasons, you're kind of there. There almost feels like there isn't any showing of that. She's like, I have dragons, and <laughs> just burns down the place if she gets angry or yeah. burns that motherfucker to death. Yeah, um, Daenerys. Especially, I agree with you. Season three is the low point of Daenerys' storyline, I think, because. Yeah. You want her to not be in the location she's in for as long as she's there. Um, yeah, she, she, there's a lot of... And I, I remember that, I think, in the books as well, is that she is in that place for a long time. However, um, the the irony in that... Uh, um, so so in the in the show, um, there's Daenerys, there's the translator, and there's like the, the, the guy that's selling her the army or whatever. Yes. And so... In the show, you see the guy doesn't speak common and says everything to the translator, and he's usually saying something rude or crass and mm-hmm. whatever. He's speaking Valerian, right? Yeah, he's sp- speaking Valerian, and then the translator translates it to, to Daenerys, and it's just you know that common translator back and forth. Yes. Um. So what's great in the books is that each book takes the perspective of a character. So all of Daenerys' story is taking place from Daenerys' point of view, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, as soon as that section starts, you already are aware that 
Daenerys understands what this guy is saying. Mm -hmm. Um, and what makes it better is that you can see her thought process of trying to out with this dude. Like you, you, you get into her head of like what she's thinking and what she's planning and like how she's like positioning herself. You get to see her make the moves on the chessboard essentially. Yeah. Um, you, you really don't see that in the show because they just use that more of a plot twist and a way to develop Danny's ability to really kind of manipulate the scene. I really like that scene in the show. So. I mean, the scene is good in the show. It's just like it kind of goes like, oh, wow. When in the book, it's presented of like presented that, oh, she knows these languages. It's a little more methodical in the book. While in the show, yeah. it's a little more uh, shocking and uh, it's a grand surprising. Reveal. Yeah. Um, Differences of medium, I think. I, yeah, and I agree. And I think that's like a big part of uh, the reasons why I like the books more. And I would read the books. It's just. I can't get into something that I know isn't going to end. Oh no, it's never. It's uh yeah. Um and like with Wind of Winds of Winter like never coming out, I feel like it's not worth my time to actually read them because the story is just not going to end. Which is hard, which is terrible to say because I think they're really well read well written books. And I think there's a lot of stuff in there that's not in the, that's not in the shows that's really good. It's just I can't just get myself attached to something that I know I'm never going to be satisfied with its ending. Or lack of thereof. Mm -hmm. so, does George R. R. Martin still say that he's going to finish writing it? I he does. So. Is he still he's, pretending to write it? Oh. He's, he's writing short stories about Westeros. Oh, okay. So it's like, I don't oh know, boy, man. That's, he's doing um, the Miura thing with Berserk instead yeah. of finishing your story. Go do yeah. a side. Uh, no, at least the Berserk thing apparently was good, right? Uh yeah, and I actually just got the book in the mail. So hey. after I finished Pet Cemetery, I'm moving on to that. Nice. Uh, season four. I just watched season four the other night. Oh God. More like uh, season snore. No uh, man. No. Se season oh, four is I, some of the best television I've no, seen. Right. Through, through, through. Season so season three was really a low point, and then season four, I got to the point where I stopped, which is the second episode, and a very significant thing happens in that yes. second episode. Great, great um, things. Yeah, and so I was like, oh, okay. And then um, I watched them more. And I was like, okay, I, I enjoyed season four. Like, I, I, I liked it. Um, there there's some good character growth. Uh, da Daenerys is set up in a way that's a little bit more interesting than it was in the previous seasons, I feel like. She's also uh, leaving the location soon, right? Like, that, that really helped me get back into her storyline, I think. No, she she like gets to a place and basically starts ruling over it. Yeah, uh, okay. Still wasn't uh, super into that one. Um, it was better though because you got but, to see uh, some things that will come into fruition later. Yeah. Um, but this season four felt like a lot of setting up for da Daenerys and what she's doing, or what's gonna what she has to deal with later. Um, it's a great Tyrion season. I feel like in oh, his yeah. character. Man. Um. The courtroom scene in episode seven is some of the best acting I've ever seen. Yeah, that's I think it was great. seven. Man, shit gives me chills. Uh, the Viper was cool. <laughs> the Viper was cool. That that's a interesting fight. I don't. Yeah. I, I it's an interesting fight, but it, I didn't feel any tension into it. I felt shocked, but not tension, which was weird. I um, felt tension because I felt well, you know, I, I I could feel something happening there, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, but um, but season five, it, it's kind of interesting because Tyrion has taken kind of the, the 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 background role in this season so far. He doesn't show up a lot, mm -hmm. uh, which is sad because he's one of my favorites. But I'm really liking Daenerys' storyline in this and what she has to deal with. I like, forget what's go. Is it the harpies? The son of the harpies? Yeah, the no, son of harpies. Okay, yeah, that was. No, oh, yeah, I think I like that one. And then, and then you have Cersei, who is just going fucking crazy. So uh, I really love Cersei's portion of that storyline. I, I do too. hate the Sparrow portion of that storyline. But the, but they're tied together. Well, I like what's going on with Cersei. I hate the plot elements of it. We'll, we'll put it that way. I. I, I don't though because I like that 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 Cersei is is now kind of I don't know lowering or raising herself above 
the culture of this place is that she's now putting herself above all of this cultural norms to get what she wants. Yes, um, but the the sparrows have such plot armor opiness, which is a problem. Some like some OP. characters in Game of Thrones, yeah, op. <laughs> hey. Uh, okay, so, okay, whatever. Go on. Well, don't interrupt me with your childish spats. No, um, you, you said that. I did. Um, <laughs> I just didn't mean it like that. Her, the OP <laughs> level of the of the current enemy of that arc um, is something Probably. that Game of Thrones struggles with. Where like Ramsay yeah. Bolton kind of has it. Another character later on, like everything just always goes right for them. Yeah, freaking Ramsay Bolton runs in is it this season or previous season i forget oh also theon's storyline i really got interested in after yes. season two yeah theon's uh, great yeah uh uh they do a good thing in that book that's a plot twist that actually yeah is great. I, i've heard about that that's really cool the reek plot yeah. twist um which i can understand why you couldn't do that because you can't just like <laughs> yeah <laughs> let me <laughs> Let us uh, blur this actor's face the whole season and then unblur. Yeah, um, there, there's something in literature you can do. Um, but anyways, kind of getting more to it. Uh, Arya's is another one that I feel like I'm just I want to see where it goes, but I'm I just feel like it's very boring. Hate, but hate I, there's Arya's a great line. Scene where she she enters a room. And there's a bunch of things in this room, and yes. I thought that was really cool and creepy. What a really cool what a set design for that room. Yeah, I, I thought that was really neat. Um, but I don't know like where it's going for her, so I want to see where that happens. Um, the Jamie storyline is really fun, I feel. Which one was that again? Uh, he goes to kidnap his dog. Yes. His dog yes. back. Oh, a lot of people hate that storyline because of Sand Snakes and how, how kind of bad they are. The who? The Sand Snakes. Oh, is that the the women warriors? Yeah, uh, I like them, but whatever. It's okay. very that that one that section stands out because it's very like it has a lot of brawn, so I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very high fantasy kind of actiony section of that show. I, it, maybe it, maybe that's why people don't like it. They I, don't I want. So. It's very adventurous. I feel like it's it's a very kind of adventure book kind of feel. Yeah, I like, rescue the princess. And I yeah, think I that think a lot of. Spin they wanted to put on it, but I can see why people didn't like it. I think a lot of Game of Thrones fans uh, reject that notion of they they don't want the show to be very fantasy. They wanted to su subvert fantasy at every turn, um, mm -hmm. which will lead to disappointment in uh, later seasons as plot lines reach their inevitable. So, next up, okay, so the boys are going to talk <laughs> about Pet Cemetery here. Oh, oh man, um. I don't know, Joe. What is what is there to say about this? All right, crazy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna crazy start, book. I'm gonna start off. I finished Pet Cemetery. I finished the, it Sunday or Monday night. Real yeah. quick, this this is the book, not the the recent film. Yes, we're talking yes. this is the book by Stephen King. We're, we're talking about the book, Bradley and I's book club. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I I finished it, uh, Bradley. I don't know how many how much longer you have left in the book. Yeah, so I'm a little bit into part two. Um, okay. I had been going slowly, and then I learned that Joe had finished, and then I learned that uh, we kind of wanted to talk about it this week. So um, I sped up a lot. On Sunday, I read 100 pages. Yesterday, I read about 50. So uh, I'm a little bit into part two. Um, I haven't finished, but I feel like I can have some kind of grasp on yeah. um, the direction yeah. the book is going and yeah. kind of, you know, um, the themes. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to talk about that a lot. Uh so I like this book. Um, I have some problems with it, but I also really like a lot of the themes this book is talking about. And so to give an overview, uh, the book is essentially about a guy, a guy named Lewis Creed who moves it, moves to Maine with his family. To with his family, he has a wife, a young daughter named Ellie, and a two-year-old named Gage. Um, and they they live next to like a country road that has a bunch of like trucks speed right past his house all the time uh so one day the cat gets hit by one of these trucks and dies and his neighbor judd uh, tells him well there's a place called the pet cemetery where you bury all your pets but if you go just past it and by just past i mean like three or four miles yeah. uh <laughs> Um, just past it, you'll find an old, ancient Indian burial ground. 
Um, whatever you bury there comes back to life about three days later. Um, and that's all I'm going to give for the plot because uh, it's the it's the that's I mean that that's the premise. I mean you know that that's the premise essentially. Um, so I I would say this book is in like my top twenty books I've read. I wouldn't say top ten. I wouldn't say top five. Um, and I think partially of that to me is um is I don't want to say the ending was was bad because I actually think the ending was good. I just felt like the the climax was rushed and too short for me. Yeah. But that that's about it. Yeah, and that's fair. And you know, I haven't seen the climax yet. Um and it's kinda weird, right? Because you know, I'm I'm over halfway through this book and I feel like it took till about halfway through the book before we really got into like the meat of what's going to be like truly happening right uh in the book even if you could see it coming before then a little over halfway is where it starts happening so i'm like okay you know how is this going to escalate you know how is it going to resolve so uh, i could see that and like i said you know the a lot of people come to stephen king books for the horror and if you're looking for the horror um, it doesn't start till about 60 pages in, which yeah. I'm totally fine with that because I can do with a slow burn. But um, some people would probably be like, okay, can we, you know, fucking get on with it? Yeah. Question. Question from the gallery. Yeah. yeah. Um, how is the horror in this book? I've never read a horror so, book. Oh, man. Um, so I don't really know what a horror book would really entail. Please, so, please tell me about that. Yeah. Um, how do I explain this? The the big horror in this book, and Brad, you can, you can like talk to me and and or you can like yeah. say like no, I I disagree. But the big horror to me in this book is existential dread. Uh, hello. I'm, re I'm recording again. I think this uh, thunderstorm is really going to make this a pain in the ass. But, Joe, tell me about the existential dread of a uh, pet cemetery. Yeah, so so there's just, there's a lot of existential dread. And it's mainly about death and dying and people dying around you. And, like, how to deal with that. Grief is a big theme in this book. Um, and after reading this, I feel a lot better about people's about people dying and death and all that and i'm not saying like you know i want everyone to die it's just like i i feel more comfortable with the idea of death in life kind of deal yeah you know? and i was having the exact same thought and i thought it was really weird because the book simultaneously makes me extremely anxious about either me or someone i know dying but also more comfortable about yeah. those things at the same time god that, that's um, really interesting I, yeah can you how does the book do that i guess in a non-spoiler is it even i mean i guess y'all can go into spoilers i don't think i'm going to read this okay uh but i might uh, watch the movie so you can uh, go half so, spoilers oh okay so i i looked up the plot of the recent movie uh yeah. and it's 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 essentially the same up until um the part two start you've, okay. you've read the first page of part two right because that basically tells you the big thing that happens yeah. Yeah. okay so that's that's different that's a different character that happens to oh my god yeah uh which i don't think is a i can understand why they would make that choice for a movie yeah. but i i don't i prefer the stephen king of that better yeah. uh because and I'll, I'll get into why uh, when we talk about spoilers um but the so, so my next question is, Bradley, where are you in the book in terms of, like, what is Lou doing at this point? Yeah, so... Um, so spoilers now. Yeah, if I guess we're going into spoiler territory. So um, I've reached the beginning of part two, and part two is where um, Lewis and Rachel's son, their toddler, Gage, dies. Um, and he, he's a victim of the yeah. trucks on the highway that we've seen passing by since like the first, like maybe page of the novel. 
like um, like every other like every time they're at the house there was the mention of this of a truck just blaring by yeah um and, yeah and it's really it's really creepy and they did something leading up to where part two of the book starts there's, there's a really interesting thing stephen king did um he did it with gage and he also did it with norma before that where just out out of nowhere it's like a totally normal sentence like you know i think i think they were just chilling at the house um and it's like this took place 10 weeks before normal would die and then it yeah. just continues <laughs> talking yeah no i had to reread that sentence like twice yeah like, i was like what? do you want to roll that back for a second like <laughs> yeah. is, is this literary jump scares is that is that what kind of that's it, kind of one of them yeah um but it does a great thing because it prepares you to what's going to happen but at the same time, it it, it it almost sets a bomb in your brain where it's like, this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen, but I don't know when it's going to happen. Well, it tells you in 10 weeks, but you don't really get an idea of what 10 weeks is in book time because you just yeah. go page by page. That's really uh, – so two things about that. The bomb analogy is really good because uh, Alfred Hitch- Hitchcock it's, it's, is allegedly the master of, of suspense and horror. Like that's oh, the yeah. title he's, he's been g- given, he right? He sets elements up that you know are just gonna pay did, off big time. Exactly. You Alfred Hitchcock. Did you mean to say Alfred Hitchcock? Yes. Okay. Okay. The the director. Yes. <laughs> um, not Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, Hitchcock. Um, he uh he has a famous analogy of a bomb where a, a conversation is happening and then boom, an explosion happens, and yeah. that's kind of shocking. But he finds it way more suspenseful to show the viewer that there's a bomb under the table and then show the conversation going as Ooh. normal. Yeah, now yeah. the viewer has the building dread of like, what are they going to do about the bomb? Yeah, um, it's that exact same it, uh, it's, that, it's that exact same kind of setup. Yeah, it's really called good setup. dramatic irony. That's the literary term for it. Yeah? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's, it's irony that which the audience knows more than the player ah. or the characters in the play or the, um, or the book or the story. Essentially, you know something more than the characters do. You know, uh, another thing that did that recently is a little series called JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Joe knows. Anyways, yeah. back to yeah. your regular scheduled um, pet death. So, yeah. So, so like, the, the Gage die was pretty foreshadowed. And uh, um, I, I'm going to – I am going I think I'm going to talk a little bit ahead of you, Bradley, but it's not going to spoil too much. That's fine. I feel um, but essentially, uh, you really don't get the details of Gage's death until about like a third into part two. Yeah. And it, and it breaks it down like step by step. Like how, you, exactly how it played out. It, yeah. And, and you and you see what's happening. You know what's going to happen. And like you're kind of like holding on like just like I just want to get through what's happening because I know what's happened. I've already come to the conclusion of what's happened. I just need it's like it's like the slow ripping of a band aid. Um. Uh, so and you kind of get this. Uh, so you, uh, I, w- I want to talk about more about like how he makes death easier, but I can't get into that because it spoils a well, very important. Here's what I'm thinking. So when Bradley finishes, yeah, the book, we'll have a, a follow up, um, and then you can get into spoilers about that. And yeah, then you, okay. you guys right here can discuss everything up and leading to that, to, so we can cover it. Yeah, um, so so that's one thing that I want to talk about. But the other thing that – the main thing that I feel like beforehand that really talks about uh, making it feel better for death is is two things. Um, Judd has a great line in which he says, sometimes dead is better. Yeah, and that's like the iconic line. Like even people who yeah. have virtually pe- – like people who don't know anything else about Pet Cemetery usually know that line. And I, that, that was yeah. also me. I knew this line, I think. Uh, yeah. Now that you mention it, I, I've definitely heard that before. Um, so so that's, that, that gets said uh, like when Judd is explaining the Pet Cemetery or yeah. explaining the, the, the Mimac graveyard and behind it. Um, the other thing is, so halfway into part one, their pet cat Church dies. Uh, and Church is, like a, is beloved by Ellie... Um, this is like her favorite like she she doesn't go anywhere without him and so she has this like complete breakdown at the beginning of the book that she's afraid that church is going to die yeah um and 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 the dad's and the dad's a doctor he's like you know death 
it's just part of life and he's just kind of like to wave it off and say like oh she'll get over and whatever uh but then the cat dies and the dad's just like well fuck she's going to be upset that the cat has died now and he's like yeah. I, he he just doesn't know what to do mm-hmm. at all. and 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 judd comes along and tells him about the cemetery and they go bury the cat and the cat comes back and the cat is the cat is immediately like not himself yeah it, it's uh, cl- it's clearly acting different than it was before yeah uh he's sluggish he's not graceful like he just like runs into things uh, he will go off and just kill animals and bring them back to the house and not eat them, just like kill them and then like stack them in a pile in the garage. <laughs> Does the family accept the cat back into the house because the oh, little girl wants him back? Man. Can I yeah. quote a certain line? Please. Yeah, go ahead. Whenever Ellie, Lewis's daughter, gets back and she sees her cat church again for the first time since she, you know, went on vacation. She is immediately oh, yeah, like, mentioned, like this whole thing happened while his family was off and Thanksgiving vacation. And he has to stay behind because he's in charge of like the the medic system, the uh, sure. medical office at so, his university. Yeah, but this yeah. girl doesn't know her cat ever died. It came back to life. She gets back. She's like, oh, there's my oh, cat. She's like, she's like, she's like, oh, it stinks, and she's like, oh, he's acting weird and stuff like that. But there's one line that was just like, holy shit to me, and um. I think it was after Norma had died um, and Lewis was kind of talking to his daughter about, you know, how to, ha- how to handle these feelings she's having. And when yeah. she was on her way out of his room to go to bed, she's like, you know, dad, uh, if, if church died, I-, I think I'd be able to handle it. Um, yeah. And then immediately after she says it, like her hands go up to her mouth, like, holy shit, th- did I just say that? Um, because Ooh. it's, it's a really terrifying thought to have that, about somebody that you love but Mm -hmm. um they even address that with uh other people that's a very real thought people have in real life like when um like when a loved one has been in the icu for many many months a lot of people will say you know sometimes dead is better yeah there's a really good movie that the whole movie is an abstraction of that very theme. I don't yeah, want to call pet cemetery. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's the whole like b- being able to admit the fact that you just want the person, like you could handle the death. Uh, I don't want to say the movie's name, yeah. uh, because getting to that point is a really big revelation of the movie. But I, I yeah. generally like that theme. You guys are you guys are selling me on this pet cemetery thing, I gotta say. Yeah. yeah. Um there's another scene that happened right after that. It's the very end of part one. It's almost like the climax of part one. Yeah. Cause part one is very much the um existential talk about like the before death. Yeah. Like how do you deal with death when you know it's coming kind of deal. And part two is about how do you deal with death when it's already happened and how that affects people. So, so in part one, um, very early on, it's talked about how uh, I, I forget what her name is, uh, but Lewis's wife had a sister named Zelda um, yes. who died, um, and you you're kind of just told like, oh, she died of a disease, and you're not really told like what else until you get to the very end, right after Norma dies. In Rachel describing her sister's death yeah. was one of the hardest things for me to read in the book. Like, yeah. holy shit, it was horrifying. And, and it talks about how, like, uh, she talks about how, like, you know, when that person's on their deathbed, you know, you want to feel sorry for them and you want to feel bad for them and you want to do that. But there comes a point where this person is so sick and they are so needy and they feel like they deserve everything that you just want that person to die. And you, you can't and you just don't and it's just an awful thought to have because this is my sister. This is the person that I've grown up with, who's my big sister. You know, I love her. My parents love her, but but that's not my sister anymore. She has gone beyond that, and now she just is lashes out, and it's, and it's it's a horrifying like kind of thought process and dread of like, oh my god, just having to deal with that. And I think like she has to deal with that for like two years. Yeah, and she felt she felt terrible when her sister died because. She felt terrible because she was so relieved that her sister died. And she was even terrified for so long that she assumed, like, her sister's ghost could tell that she was relieved and it would try to kill her or haunt her. Oh, my God. Brad, I can't wait for you to finish the book and we come back and talk about this. Oh, my God. 
it uh like the it's it's already so good and i'm really scared because um i i think i had talked to you guys about this before the reason i decided to read this book in the first place is because there was a discussion on books that people didn't finish um and most of the you know books people talked about were like uh this book wasn't that great i didn't like it stuff like that this book the person's like oh it's one of my favorite books of all time i didn't finish it because as soon as i knew it was going to happen at the end i knew i wouldn't be able to take it if i got that far and um so to kind of bring it back uh but yeah so so but like after reading through all of that and everything else happened in the book it's just like you know I'd rather just not deal with that. <laughs> uh, and so it's it kind of just brings this idea of like, you know, death is just a process and yeah. you're going to be upset and you're going to grieve, but it's a process. It's just something that happened, just something that happens, but it's something that happens and it's something you just have to get over and you have to work through. It's yeah. not, it's, it's not a solvable problem. Yeah. It's really impressive because, um, yeah. you know, it, 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 it is a very, terrifying book at points but i i do feel like overall uh i feel like i'm getting something really good out of it yeah um if i had to uh if i had to kind of wrap up my current thoughts on pet cemetery um especially as far as like the subject matter and the horror um you know it is a horror book i'd say unlike some stephen king stuff you know there are supernatural elements to this book and you know they are key to the plot um but what makes pet cemetery truly horrifying is the stuff that's real and that yeah. you know is real and that you know is going to happen to you or someone you know someday mm -hmm. um and i think the reason he was able to make it so real is that you know didn't stephen king like he did a research on like grieving and and people that went through these tragedies yeah, and, like, by, you know, yeah. and stuff so um it, it's very real um and that's what's scary about it but overall um like joe said i probably wouldn't put it like in my top 10 or, or something but um i mean i i would consider it a classic and uh i think people should read it yeah i like yeah, I, I would say, like, if, you know, if someone was asked for a book and if someone said, is Pet Cemetery good? Like, yeah, read yeah, that I'd, book. I'd say it's good. Read. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, like, go, like, well, what's a good book to read? I, I probably wouldn't recommend Pet Cemetery because I feel like you you need to be in the mindset to kind of process that. Yeah. And you have to be really prepared to, like, this is a book about dying and, like, and that's, like, the whole plot and the whole theme. So you're going to be talking about you and your loved ones dying to yourself that whole book. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Like, uh, I might actually check this out after this discussion, and I definitely, yeah, I want to hear a part two of you guys talking about it. Uh, we'll oh, I, I we'll definitely whole, whole thing about part two where like this book is written like a Shakespearean tragedy. Ooh, Joe's got uh, some shit. He's yeah. in the back pocket. Um, I definitely want a lot more time to this. Uh, Whenever yeah. Bradley finishes, we don't want to rush him. Yeah, I'll, well, I ought to be no finished in the next him. day or two if I go at my current pace. So. Hey, next podcast then for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, are you y'all want to say anything else before we move on? We'll definitely come back to this. Um, I do <laughs> want to say something else. Uh, Willer, it took me several minutes to realize back during the Game of Thrones talk that when you said "o oh, penis." You were saying like N E S S and not like yes. N I S. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was like, why, I was like, um, why do you say O penis? Oh. Um, <laughs> go go ahead, Joe. So so my recommendation is if you like books that kind of really want the challenge, not challenge, but kind of like make you think about existential crises and has a bit of horror element and really kind of talks about the dynamics of family and death and like what that has and that effect it has on the family. I would totally tell you to go pick this up. If you're looking for a book that's a supernatural horror story and like has ghosts and shit, in it, this isn't the book for you. There's the really the big kind of spooky net supernatural stuff doesn't come until the end and it's very quick. Um, but if you're someone that really likes that kind of real life tension and and that that like kind of um, oh god this could be me situation, I would I would definitely pick that up. Um, it, 
that's that's you'll get that feeling for sure. It's a good book. Yeah. That's that's the rating. It, it's a good book out of five. It's a good book. Um, the drive is oh. three and a half hours, the three hours or so. So good podcast time. But I didn't have anything to work with. So I I'm decided not to about podcasts. Well, you know, as much as I love our discussions, I do get to listen to them as I'm editing. So (laughs) I'll go back to them when we're old and I'll be like, I want to see what dumb shit we had to say about Game of Thrones and whatever. Man, I'm a Um, fucking idiot. Man, I can't believe I like that shit. Um, So (laughs) I I decided to listen to the... This is kind of different, but I thought I'd bring it up. I decided to listen to the Billy Eilish album, Where Do We Go When We Fall Asleep. No, When We Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go. Sorry. Um, I was about to say. Which Joe uh, read that title on the docket for this week. And it's like, are you just going to ask us an existential question, or is this actually a thing? <laughs> Especially at the Pet Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This is fitting. Um... I wanted to be quick about it. Uh, I've never listened to Billie Eilish. Uh, but this got some buzz where people that don't listen to pop music, which would mostly include me as well, they seem really into this album. Uh, Tyler described her as a mumble rapper, but there's no rapping in this album. So I, <laughs> yeah, I was very confused when Tyler said uh, that. I've only listened to a few of her songs, but she doesn't sound like a mumble rapper. She sounds like mumble, mumble sometimes she yeah. definitely doesn't she she doesn't mumble on this album she sings her lungs out like there's a oh, lot of what? singing it's very dark poppy singing um go, really good album uh i like this girl i i think she's gonna be big she she uh has a cool aesthetic to her music she oh, can, dude, she's been blowing up man yeah cool aesthetic is that every song and every album is in lowercase letters yes that is her gimmick um yeah. Album's really good. I only dislike two songs. The last five song stretch is like legitimately amazing. I've been kind of starved for music for a little while. With uh, none of my favorite artists have put out anything in like a year. So you got like Kanye's dead and Drake hasn't put anything out and Kendrick is out there somewhere and Frank Ocean's out there. Kendrick's uh, playing his next Pulse Surprise. Yeah, probably. He's probably planning his next masterpiece or whatever. Yeah. Uh,. Which leaves the last good album I got uh, was an Arctic Monkeys album that just came out in 2018. That was the best album I've heard in five years, so I guess that was okay. But um, <laughs> no big deal. But aside from that, I have been a little star for music, so this was good. Um, she's like 17 years old, so that's a lot Shit. of talent for a, for a young lass. Um, it also makes this album kind of awkward. When she's there's a song called "Bad Guy" where she's like, "I'm the seduce your dad type." Oh, like, I've oh. heard that song. Okay, <laughs> that's a good song. Um, the album's really dark. The production's fucking amazing. I wouldn't say it carries the album, but like, definitely mm-hmm. elevates it. And um, she gets real existential and and morbid and like, it's like holy sh- a sixteen year old, which is probably how old she was when she was writing this song, like these songs probably shouldn't be so I, I don't know like it feels wrong for them to hear them say these things but i mean you would think it would sound like teen angst right but like the maturity to the songwriting is really noticeable so i'll say if that's her life then uh i guess she knows how to write it mm-hmm. it it's just the writing makes her seem wiser than her ears so the subject matter gets more weight as a result i'll um, say that's a that's a vibe i've heard thrown around about her is that um is she has a certain kind of um it sounds like she has a certain kind of maturity that you wouldn't expect someone in her age or position to have yeah she definitely has goofy moments on the album but then she she really gets you and like the last song of the album uh i guess the story is she dies somewhere around the last three tracks (laughs) yeah um (laughs) And uh, the last song is like a bunch of lyrics from every song in the album, like sung in a really harrowing way. It's really mm. beautiful, but like spooky. Um, and it's just purely lyrics, like the standout lyrics from each track in one song. It, oh, I like that. It's a really interesting way to close out an album. I've never, I've never seen that. So, yeah, I wanted this to be brief, um, just quick music section. Uh, yeah, you know what? I know what I'm listening to tonight. I've heard, th- I've heard that... Um... 
I think the chorus of that, like bad I'm guy the bad type or whatever. It, it's thing. the it's the uh, single of the album, so it's okay. definitely a popular track. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna have to listen to this. Uh, she had another one too that I've listened to. I bury a, bury a friend was another one. That that's I've... the other single. That's a really good one. Yeah, that, um, that's yeah. that's the one I hear on the the car radio when I go places. It comes on like every so often. Um, and it's very spooky. Yeah, the the album has a lot of the production, like, and her and her singing, very harrowing. It's, it's a good listen. Give it a try. It's very different nice. from what I usually listen to, so that was a nice change of pace. Um, I'm gonna transition right next into our next topic because that same weekend, um, my friend who got engaged and I, uh, we were you playing. Engaged? Not not a, yes, we got engaged <laughs> together. Um. We were playing video games and whatnot. Oh god, uh, uh, I'm getting messages. I didn't consider this. Oh no! <laughs> I'm, getting mes- on the plan. I'm getting mess. I'm getting messages on my Mac, which is what I'm recording on, which is gonna make really loud ping sounds. Uh, someone's asking me about JoJo's Part Four. I, I have to answer you guys now. Oh shit! I didn't hear any pings. <laughs> I think you're good. No, I well, the recording is gonna hearing the, hear the oh, pings because that's how that that's works. Nice. Well, cut cut off now. No, no, questions. no, because then and there then will we... come more questions. Anyways, uh, we were playing some video games. We were playing Sekiro. I beat Genichiro. You know that time you fight him at the start without your tools? That felt pretty good. Um, oh, really? What, yeah. What, what changed? Did anything change? No, I just knew his moves. Felt good. But, like, but I mean, like, did, did, like, you get to, like, did your arm still get cut off? So the cutscene plays out a little differently, which is, oh. uh, but your arm does get cut off. He, he, he cheat blows you. And then he says a line where it's like, you're a shinobi, so you know that uh, winning with a cheat blow, there's no shame in that as long as you won. I was Damn. like, oh, that, that's pretty cool, and that fits that his, the owl cool. teachings. Um, yeah. So we played a little bit of new game, because uh, he did the alternate ending where he didn't fight Sword Saint. He fought uh, Fire whatever Ishin, and he what? accidentally, yeah, that's a thing that Ooh. can happen. Um, more on that at a later date. Uh, so he deleted his save, so we were going through it. Um, we share games, so I got him to download Resident Evil 2, uh, and he was pooping himself. Gr- gr- we'll talk about Resident Evil 2 later. Um, but, yeah. So, to get to the point, we watched the movie, and it was John Wick, because I've never seen John Wick, and John oh, Wick 3 is coming out, uh, in a couple weeks or something. Um... And it's been on my to-watch list, but my to-watch list is also, like, a hundred movies long, so some stuff just doesn't happen um, very quickly. But I always get around to it eventually. So, and then today, I watched John Wick 2, so I'm going to talk about both of them real quick. John Wick 1, Bradley, do you know, like, I know Joe's seen the movie. Um, No, I haven't seen it, but from what I've heard, like, if you're after just, like pure unadulterated action like this is the movie for you yeah can can i can i summarize what john wick one's about yeah, yeah go for it okay so here's the story about john wick one um a bunch of russian mafia goons break into john wick's house and kill his dog john, w- his car. john wick kills the mafia that's the movie <laughs> now you're skipping a part there where... no 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 that's you know... literally the movie well, you're skipping the part where John Wick kills the Mafia because he's the most legendary assassin that, that's, in the that's land. Scary. But the plot of the movie is the yeah. Russian Mafia breaks into his house, kills his dog. He's like, I'm The so plot scared. of the movie isn't interesting, but the backstory is, yeah. in my opinion, where they find out John Wick killed the dog, and they're no like, way. they found they they find they find out, and it's like the Mafia boss, his son killed the dog, and he just resigns when he finds out. He's like. My son fucking killed John Wick's dog, and like, oh, God. and that immediately sets the tone for what kind of man there, this is. It has two of my favorite scenes. Uh, the first scene being, um, uh, the the mafia boss calls up this mechanic dude, and it's like, "What the fuck? You hit my son? Why'd you hit my son?" And this guy is like the like break your kneecaps, shoot you in the head kind of mafia boss, and yeah. the mechanic just goes like. Your son killed John Wick's dog. And, and stole his car. Him. Yeah. Now the dog uh, has... Now go on. Yeah, finish finish yeah. your thought, I guess. So too. he's like, yeah, he, he killed John Wick's do- dog and stole his dog. I'm, and killed his car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he killed his car real bad. 
Yeah. <laughs> he, he's like, starting over. The mechanic goes, he killed his dog and stole his car. And the mafia boss just goes, oh, and immediately hangs up. It, it God, sets like it sets such an incredible tone. Yeah, um, like and then there's a whole scene of of him explaining who John Wick is to his son, and it's one of the best. It's it's so good. It's 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 amazing because it just sets up John Wick. It's like an exposition dump, but the way that they the guy like delivers it and the. You see John Wick like getting his guns in the background, and he's like taking a hammer and like breaking the foundation of his house because that's where he kept all of his assassins' equipment. Now, something it's... missing here is that John Wick quit his life of yeah. uh, of assassining, I suppose, because yeah. um, he found a nice wife and he settled down. And the she got cancer. This is really early in the movie, so it's not that it's not a spoiler. She yeah. gets it's like the first scene. She gets cancer and she gives John Wick the dog. As like a you know I I know like the kind of person dog. you are like, yeah I'm I, gonna be there I'm not here but I'm always gonna be with you kind of thing it, it's I know the person you are and I know you're gonna need something to anchor yourself down to mm -hmm. um and they kill the one thing and he has an amazing line it's probably my favorite line of the movie where he's like you guys killed my one chance to not grieve alone mm -hmm. um and that really sets. It really paints the picture for like what this dog meant to John Wick, and how in the back of this all he's really grieving about his wife and how he had finally escaped his life of assassinism, and uh, it gets brought right back in, and the yeah. movie has really good action as he dismantles this mafia. Um, and yeah, I the this movie does a great job of showing and not telling. I feel of who John Wick is just mm -hmm. by the reactions of what. Of like John Wick talks to somebody, and like every time he talks to somebody, with the exception of like two or three people, they're just like, "Yeah, okay, uh huh," and then they leave. Like there's there, there's a terrified look on everyone's face whenever he interacts with them. And, and um, yeah, he. So the most interesting part of this movie, it has really good action. Um, uh, I'm gonna show my hands early and say I do have some problems with this movie, but the most interesting part of this movie. Is it sets it be, it begins setting up an assassin's guilt. So John Wick checks into a hotel where assassins are allowed to check in, and they all trade like gold medallions and stuff for all the services within the hotel. And within the hotel grounds, you are absolutely not allowed to conduct business. You're not allowed to kill someone. You're not allowed to do an assassination. You're not allowed to kill another assassin. It's basically like safe base. It is a safe base, and it. You begin to realize there's this whole underworld of assassins that is really well fleshed out, especially in the next movie. Um, uh, that's the most interesting part of the movie for me. John Wick is a really likable character. Um, uh, would you agree, Joe? Like, I, I ended yeah. up really – Keanu Reeves puts on a really good performance. Yeah. Um, and I want to say, like, when I, when I went to this movie, my friend's like, no one's going to see John Wick with me. And I was like, oh, I really don't want to see it because it just seems like dumb action. But, you know, I'm not doing anything tonight. Let's let's go see it. And I walked out of the movie like, that's probably one of the best action movies I've seen in like 10 years. Um, and it's uh, – but, yeah, but Keanu Reeves does a really good job of playing John Wick. And he's really – and Willer, you had this conversation the other day about uh, – or this topic the other day about characters that that the – author or the writer wants mm. you to think is cool um and actually pulls it off and this is one of those characters i feel God, but he does it so effortlessly i, I feel like yeah. my, my conversation was more like the characters that are thrown in your face it's like look how cool john wick is just like so effortlessly uh organically cool um right he he has a weird charm about him that is only really brought about because of keanu reeves like his complexities as an actor and like little subtle things it makes him really charming and also scary and you just kind of rooting for this guy that is decimating people um keanu reeves does a lot of practice when he does action movies and it really shows because they never cut away they never use a stunt double at least as far as i can tell um the shots aren't like quick and like messy like they're you can see everything in the action they're well lit um for the most part 
And John Wick has, like, this really good trigger discipline where he will take you down, he'll pop you in the head twice, he'll pop that guy in the head twice. He's very meticulous with how he makes sure that his opponents are killed. And you can... The other thing, he looks professional when he does everything. Like, you watch, like, Schwarzenegger movies or, like... Any like old eighty action movies, you can look at the actors and they're they're kicking ass, but it feels very rugged. Like it doesn't feel like this person actually does his job a lot of the times, even though the movie sets him up as being a commando or whatever. Like it feels rough, but this like feels methodical in everything that he does. Yeah. It sounds to me like the reason um, it pulls off that oh my god he's so cool thing is uh, because of what Joe said where. It doesn't tell you how cool he is. It shows you. And I think that's the right way to do it. Okay. Let me talk about my problems with this movie. Um, And it's mostly all technical stuff. I I don't like the musical score in it. Uh, The editing is really jarring in, like, flashbacks. And, like, the lighting is really harsh in some scenes where the movie is just not great to look at sometimes. And Mm. I don't like the third act of this movie. I I agree on that. I feel like... uh... So I, I don't remember the actor's name, but he's Theon Greyjoy in yes. Game of Thrones. He was a little shit um, in this movie. Shit. Yeah, um, but essentially, like as soon as the movie gets to the point where he dies, it kind of just falls off. Yeah, big time. Because he's the kind of instigator of this whole event, essentially, and now it's just kind of gratuitous at that point. And I, and I agree with you, and that doesn't like take away from the rest of the movie. I feel, but like it, that final act is just kind of. I get, no. not, I don't want to say tacked on, but it doesn't feel like as earned as everything else. Now, okay, um, I'm gonna give John Wick a three out of five. It's a good movie. I, I give it a four out of five. When, but yeah. So every complaint I had about John Wick and every and every um, praise yeah. I I got to give to it. Uh, remove all the complaints and double the praise for John Wick two. Oh, I. Really? Oh, I fucking loved this movie. John Wick 2 was a vast improvement in everything. It's a really interesting character study on John Wick. Damn. Because uh, in John yeah, Wick that's... 1, he's just... You, have you not seen 2? No, I, I was going to see 2, and then <gasps> some, I, life got caught up, and I never saw it, so I haven't Yo, seen it. Yo, we should have watched it together. Okay, I didn't know you didn't see it. Um, So, John Wick 2 takes John Wick, and... John Wick 1 was a lot of action, show how cool John Wick is. He's going, 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 going. John Wick 2 starts with a slower pace where you get to see how the repercussions of John Wick's past and not only the last movie, but his overall past is building up to him being in this life that he just really can't escape now that he got himself back in. He was good there for a while, but because he just had to grieve for his wife and get that revenge... It was all that really he really had. He's back in the life. Um, the movie builds upon the Assassin's Guild in such a cool way. Uh, there's this scene where John Wick is going through. He in this one, he is doing a proper assassination for a portion of the movie, no, um, and you get to see his prep time for an actual assassination, not a murder spree like the first movie. <laughs> not a genocide. <laughs> a borderline genocide, which is really different. He has particular guys he goes to for uh, blueprints and layouts and guns, and he gets the literal plot armor in this movie, which actually is a great addition where he gets this really badass suit with a really nice material where he can soak up bullets. Um, he, he still gets hurt by it, but it lets the action be a little more creative. In the first movie, there was scenes where, like, very plot armory scenes where, like, John Wick would lose his gun. Oh, great. Ev- all of a sudden, everyone's fighting him hand-to-hand, and there's no one else around <laughs> anymore. It happened, like, every time. Um, and, I mean, it's an, it's an action movie. It's going to have those dumbness. There, uh, there are action transitions, yeah. Now, this movie does a lot better with that, where, like, he either... He either doesn't get in those situations where it's like hand to hand and no one else shows up. It's the action is just a lot better balanced. It's it the the set pieces and like where they fight and just incredible. There's this one fight where it's him and another assassin walking through a crowd and the assassin's like in an upper floor and John Wick is in the lower floor. And they're walking through a crowd, so they're trying to be discreet, and they both have silenced pistols. So they're just like as they're walking, they're like shooting like little pop shots at each other, like pew pew. 
pew, 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 like just <laughs> as they're walking through a crowd and no one's noticing. And it's like the the funniest but most interesting little set piece. Um, the villains in this movie are way more interesting. There's notable assassins. There's a more interesting villain than Theon Greyjoy and the mafioso from the first one. Uh, it ends on a insane plot twist, or not? I mean, is not a plot twist, but a cliffhanger. Um, this this is a five out of five movie, and I'm very excited for John Wick three. Yeah, yeah three's it, coming out soon, huh? Yes, yeah. Bradley, you should two. get in on this. Get on the bandwagon. Yeah. We can we can go watch three. Where, where did where did you watch two? Like, well, you know how I watched three. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I see. Uh, but hey, we could watch it on Discord because that's a thing now, apparently. True. I, I woke up and had to do stand ups, and I was just like about to explode. That's Hi, right. buddy. <laughs> oh, hey. Now, Joe's not going to talk about his explosive morning. Instead, he's going to talk about a video game called Anno. Joe, what the hell is this? Tell okay. us about it. So, Anno. Anno is a series of games. Um, I'm going to preface this, but that I am going to just be talking about Anno 1800, what came out about two weeks ago. Um, but Anno is a series of games. I I know nothing about Anno lore wise or plot wise or whatever. I just I, all I know is kind of like generally what the type of game it was. Um, it it kept on showing up on my Steam uh, for t- Anno like 20. 20- 705 or something like that like a future version of the game or a sci-fi setting of the game and I just didn't have any interest of it and so then uh, I saw Anno 1800 and it's set in the 1800s and I was like oh I like that a sec a little more it's like right at the cusp of the industrial revolution and goes through it and I really like that setting and aesthetics so I was like I'll pick it up and it's probably one of the best like god like city builder games I've ever played. Ooh, do tell. Ooh, uh, how, how does so, it stack up to the others? I, I think it's it's pretty good. Uh, I, I think one of the best like kind of games like this I've ever played. Um, so what the game is is, and once again, I don't know anything about the lore, or whatever part of the world, but essentially you are a like a designated tradesman by the queen. To go settle islands and like produce and populate the islands and like trade um, materials between other people in the uh, in the country itself. So you're you're essentially like a colony set settler person. Does that make sense? Yes. Like you yes. go and establish colonies essentially. And so each island has its own fertility. Like this island can produce peppers. This island can produce uh like beer hops. This island can. Doesn't doesn't really have any good fertile ground, but it's got fucking gold in it. Go get it. Hey, hey that's all right. Hey. Yeah. Um. And so when's a so you so you have to. I'm I'm, I'm trying to know how to describe it because the way that you get a population in this game is it's not just building houses but also upgrading your houses. Essentially, you have a class system in your game, where you have your first class, which is farmers. And then you have another class, which is workers. And then you have artisans. And then you have engineers. And I think there's one more group past that. Um, but the only way to upgrade your farmers and the workers is you have to provide the farmer with all of its needs and like happiness. And then you get to upgrade it. And then that new group of people, that new class, has its own uh, sets of needs and wants. Yeah, so that's interesting because I feel like most yeah. games like this, they just have it so uh, like a citizen is a citizen. There's yeah. Not, yeah, and it, like they don't always differentiate between like classes like that. And the uh, thing is too is like I can't just like gather up money and resources and then purchase a citizen. I have to like entice people to come live at my colony Ooh, essentially. That's pretty fun. You, you have to make like an actually functioning society instead of like hey just get this one number high enough to buy more citizens. Basically yeah and like it, I don't have any control of which the you have an indirect control of which your like the rate of your city like grows. So like for example like your farmers are very basic uh, all they need is to have a town marketplace nearby um, they get fish and they need some clothes. That's not, that's all they need to upgrade. Okay? Um, but the speed of which that they upgrade 
is determined by the distance of the fish, the fisherman from the marketplace, the distance of the marketplace to the person in the house, um, the distance that the um, person who herds the sheep is to the clothes maker, and distance of the clothes maker to the um, to marketplace yeah, or the that's, warehouse. It's like even more in depth than like Sim City. Like, yeah. When I first heard about this, I assumed when I first heard about this game, knowing nothing about it, I was like, "Oh, it sounds like it's one of the, it's like a Civ type game." But uh, I was like, "No, this is like Mega eighteen hundred Sim City." Yeah, and um, so that so so that's an aspect of it. And then as you, and then when you get a new class, you essentially like that's the way you like upgrade your research tree. Like you're essentially like leveled up your research, and now you can do. Uh, and now that you have the worker class, you can now go mine mines and go mine clay pits. And now you can build paved roads. And then when you upgrade a little bit more, once you have more workers, it's like, oh, I can now harvest iron from the mines. But then you could become in this situation where like, oh, shit, now I have I'm making pollution and the pollution is making people unhappy, which is making people revolt. So I now have to make police uh, at the make police stations and make sure everything's covered and I have to like jigsaw puzzle everything together so it's efficient but at the same time like I have enough space to grow later and you're just thinking like oh shit god that dude. seems really fun that dude and um like I'm looking I'm looking at screenshots right now and uh man this is oh, cool the game is fucking beautiful yeah because like games like this I feel like their first priority usually isn't like graphics or like detail in the villages themselves but here like Holy so, shit. Post like, one in chat. I, I want to see. So here's the other thing about the game. The biggest complaint I have about City Builders games is that there, there's a lot of times in City Builders where you kind of like, you, you set things up and you're like, all right, I'm going to just let it do its thing. This game has you doing something every minute, every time you play. Uh, um, so first off, there's also an RTS element of this game where you have to build ships and defend yourself from raiding pirates and other like oh, like fun fanatics and as well as potentially wage war against rival trade companies this game on Steam? you no it's on you play oh yeah it's, no. a, it's a Ubisoft. <laughs> i forgot that existed ruined <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so so that's one aspect of it in addition you have like you have missions that uh some npcs give you like oh i need you to deliver like six tons of wool to this island or i need you to sail to this island pick up pick up this item and sail it back or my trading uh my trade my trade route needs an escort for this one trade can you send some ships to go trade it and you're you're sending these ships everywhere and these ships are also the same ships you use to do your own trade deals so if you have a ship doing another mission it's not going to be able to go and provide a trade route for yourself or to another person or player you also have these like colony expeditions where you go and explore the world and you come back with treasure are there um, multiple players is this multiplayer it's also multiplayer that's oh the other God, thing too. dude <laughs> that's so uh, cool it's, i want to make it, my own little village <laughs> yeah and then like and then you also then you can discover the new world and then you have to establish your own oh. call new world and you have to have your treasure routes from like one side of the island to the other and you have another it's it, there's just so much going on in this game i i'm not even a much of a city builder guy but like yeah. i i love the idea of incrementally being able to do more stuff like that's what makes stardew valley such a good game for me um and this seems to really scratch that itch so i i might check this out i don't know uh, yeah looking at the screenshots i want to make my own fun little city village yeah <laughs> and cool. there's there's oh god there's there's so much to it like you have to at one point you have to like start like advertising your uh your little town as a place where like people can come and visit f for tourism and stuff like that and it's just and so you have to like go send expeditions to go capture wild animals so you can build up a zoo or a museum so it's like more attractive to go visit because you have like treasures of the world and stuff and you're like oh my god um but uh so the other thing about this game that I really kind of like, and I think people would take this more as a negative, but it has a really short campaign. Um, I had to restart That's the campaign good. like two or three times because I have I was just like I was still figuring out the mechanics of the game. Um, and I think the camp and I think the campaign does a good job of like 
explaining to you what you need to do, but not holding your hand the entire way of what to do. Yeah. Uh, which is really good. Um, and it kind of sets a good pace of what you should be working towards and what then you should be working towards next and so on and so forth. Um, so that that's good. Like, I got to the end of the campaign. You're like, all right, now you have to actually win the game. Oh, there's also, like, victory conditions in the game, and you have to discover them for yourself. So I don't even know what they are. Um, it's 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 a really in depth game. I feel um, this sounds like uh, it is genre defining. I I think so. It's it's this series has been going on for twenty years apparently. Um, but this is like their first big hit that they've had. Yeah, I was, I was um, I've seen some when I first looked this up. I, I found some like really old games, and I was like, well, I know a new one just came out. Yeah, uh, I will say though this this game is sixty dollars, which I think is a bit steep ew uh, not not saying that it doesn't deserve 60 dollars. i just know that i bought it because i will i'll play these games like this is my genre of game to play so i'm like yeah i'll, I'll play this like sure why not it looks it's beautiful i have the computer to run it um so that's one thing number two is i have a pretty decent computer and i get frame rate issues when i play on the highest settings um so I, I don't know what's going on there. I think there's some weird optimization stuff going on. Like it, the game looks and functions better. Um, obviously, we have on lower settings, but like it, it's just really weird because the game read my system was like, oh, you can play on ultra settings, fine. And then it just, it was very stuttery and jittery when I played. I was like, hmm. So, and then oh, what else? Um, just, just, I'm trying to think of more negatives. Uh, the game is like, the game is something you have to like try and fail of, fail and redo over and over again. And there are some mechanics that doesn't really tell you what you're supposed to do or how they work. And the way you get money is hard to calculate, I feel. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's essentially the way you earn money is you have a relative wealth of your. A, a rel it's based off your relative growth of your island and if your island isn't growing you don't you start going to the negatives so it's just kind of it's just a strange wrap your head around kind of thing because usually it's just like i just make positive and i just gain a bunch of money over time and really it's more like no you have to continuously grow definitely so, seems right. not traditional on that regard i not not in terms of city builders uh it might be in for the series i i don't know because i haven't played the rest of the series but i it was something that was very different um when i booted up and played it, oh this was not what i was expecting at all and i really enjoyed it for that anyways um five out of five game it probably just jumped it, it was hey. a surprise jump up to like joe's top five games of 2019 i think nice yeah, I was just like, oh man, like I, I wasn't even like following this game or I just like heard about it from some like YouTuber. I was like, oh, that looks, I like that aesthetic. I think I'll check it out. And I was like, oh, that's such I, a fun like, feeling. Yeah, I poured like 24 hours into the game after about like three days of playing it. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure if if we're still alive uh, near end of the year, this might come up in certain deliberations that we may or may not have. Yeah, um, as game of the year. Okay, is that is that all you got, Joe? Uh, yeah, is that I, all you I, got? I feel like <laughs> if you really like uh, a civilization type game or city similar type games, I would definitely check this out. This game's a good blend of both. I had a real good time with it. Um, I I really can't say big negatives on it because I feel like it's very different. It's but it's also very familiar. So I is really it like uh? That. You think it's a good starter? starter oh, city not. baby city game no. no okay great no i i feel like uh it's 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 definitely got it's, it's hard to to determine but i feel like it has a really good tutorial and it's saying like do this do this this is what you need to do and you kind of just play around with it for a little bit and there's not a lot of pressure for you i feel until like um real light into the game in terms of like oh my god i'm getting attacked all the time it's not like a rts where you have to rush through things it's a very slow burn game okay gotcha yeah. well next up 
we have okay i got a little power hour here i don't want to get too deep into any of these topics um because i'm definitely they'll probably be topics of their own as i finish them but so i said earlier that i recently got resident evil 2 uh the remake yeah. Uh, I've been waiting to get it on a sale, and a sale popped up, and I picked it up. Um, and uh, me and my friend got Devil May Cry 5, uh, which has also been a very long-awaited game for us. Uh, it wasn't on a sale, but we were just like, fuck it. <laughs> so we just bought it. Um, let's start with Resident Evil 2. This is a game where Joe has already played, and we'll definitely, as we both get further, we'll definitely be talking more about this game, I think. Cause yeah, this game's... I... I... I need to finish my Claire run through and then maybe one of the other run throughs, but I, I do want to have a discussion with you about this later. Yeah, it's I really it's, like this game. It's definitely doing some really special stuff. Very tense game. There's times where I can only play for a little while. Uh, you get you get used to the game, so it becomes less scary. But the tenseness is always there because all it takes is for you to miss like one bullet, and you already feel like you're in a disadvantage in this game. Um, if if you're not patient and you miss start missing shots, your your play starts going down significantly. You become more vulnerable to, to getting spooked by monsters on the side. Uh, really good stuff going on. Really smart design decisions. Really good feel whenever uh, you get a little puzzle piece and you get to backtrack through the through the police station or the other surrounding areas to go do a puzzle. Um, and new stuff has populated in the world. Um, that though i haven't gotten to him yet i only you haven't oh i'm so scared i don't know when he po i just finished the first boss i'm back at the i'm at the chief's office now which is right after oh, the the underground section i'm playing claire a by the way as my first one i'm gonna do leon b oh stop i don't want to be close i know <laughs> i know there's some shit that goes down in the library so i oof. all right um Devil May Cry 5, holy shit. Uh, I'll have to talk about the Devil May Cry series and the character action genre in general. That'll get its own episode. That'll, as as I finish Devil May Cry, I played all of them except 2 and DMC. DMC because it's not plot relevant and 2 because supposedly it sucks. There's only 3? There's, oh, I guess there's 4 because it's Devil May Cry. There's but... four, 4 Devil May Cry ones and the reboot. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but the reboot is... Very hated because it was so different, but the it's gameplay deep. looks really good. Um, I want to I want to play it eventually, but due to time things and me just not having time to play all these games with so many good games out, I decided to skip on it for now. Um, immediately as I got my hands on Devil May Cry Five, I was doing the coolest combos. I uh, at this point, with having played them all very recently, I've gotten pretty good at understanding Devil May Cry's combat. For example. This is a weird game where you don't dodge attacks, you, you jump. Jumping has iframes and you want to jump past most attacks. Um, you have three playable characters. I've only played as Nero so far, which um, I really like playing as Nero in 4. Uh, I know Dante has a bunch of options in this game, and I haven't played as V yet at all. Um, I think that comes up next mission. I've only done three missions. Um, I'm having... Such a good time. I I kind of want to show Bradley some of this gameplay at, at a later date because like he would he would be into some of the crazy shit I've been doing. I finished, some of the hot clips. I, I've been finishing these fights and like these bosses in the coolest ways. Um, have a pretty good stylish ranking. That the, these kinds of games rank you for how stylishly you're actually fighting, which is really fun. Um, yeah, more on that later. But. Because I started playing this game, and I was like, this is the culmination of this genre for years. But there was one notable game in the genre that I was skipping out on. Um, I haven't played uh, Metal Gear Revengeance, but I, there's no real good way for me to play that. So I won't be playing that. But I did download Bayonetta 1 and 2 a while ago, and I did beat 1. And I've been saving 2 because I knew I would really like that game. Yeah, I saw you in Bayonetta 2 on your uh, Switch today. Yes. As I was playing the first mission, I... D I did the first two. No, no, I only did one and a half. But I was immediately just blown away. The first mission of Bayonetta 2 is probably the best sequence I've ever played. It's that good. Um, like, there's this point in that sequence where there's... Bayonetta can summon demons through her hair. 
Um, and she summons one of her famous ones that's like a dragon that she uses to bite down. It's actually her final smash in Smash Bros. Uh, and that's also where her stage comes from in Smash 2, right? Is that opening sequence? That's the opening sequence of Bayo 1. Okay, that's right. In Bayo 2, you're fighting on a bunch of jets that are doing like a, sh a show. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> and giant angels come down, and the, the demon that you summon for your attacks all of a sudden breaks loose and is attacking you, which is like, whoa, I, I used this guy all of uh, Bayonetta 1, and now he, I'm fighting him. And it was just... There was something bittersweet about having to beat up my boy. Um, Not my boy. And uh, real good plot stuff happens immediately in. Uh, the plot of these games is always dumb, but like pretty fun. Bayonetta is like a really enjoyable main character, so is the Devil May Cry crew. This game, like I've always f thought that Bayo is more fun to control than any of the Devil May Cry boys. Uh, and Nier and some other character action games that I'm... I will reveal in secrecy later because I got some controversial opinions and picks. But uh, Bayo's moveset is just immediately so fun in this game. They've fine-tuned some things I can already feel. Um, she's got more moves. She's got, like, a new mechanic. Uh, just, I'm going to have a lot of fun playing these two side by side. And uh, that's, that's all I got for now. Um, more updates on these later. Uh, well, there's Capcom corner. Quickie hour. Well, it's all, it was, well, that was almost a Capcom. It was. Uh, Bayonetta is actually Sega and Platinum and Nintendo. So. Yeah. Hey. But, man, Capcom's been on fire lately. I'll, I'll do, like, a little Capcom splurge corner at a later mm -hmm. date. Because ever since Resident Evil 7, they've risen to a brand new level. Um, okay. Bradley, what the hell's fantasy life? Uh, yeah. So... We have five minutes slotted for this, and uh, I'll try to keep it within that, because... You can go longer, if need be. <laughs> we'll see. It's uh, it's kind of weird that we're even talking about this. Um, the reason we are talking about this is it briefly came up in conversation earlier this week, where um, a game that I waited for, for the English version for a long time, The Snack World, um, like the anime... I saw like an episode of the anime that is based on the game, and I was like, oh, I really like this, and uh, it reminded me of Fantasy Life. So we briefly talked about it. Um, it the way it was d described to me that got me hooked on it was it's like Animal Crossing Skyrim, which I don't think is entirely accurate, but whatever image that phrase puts in your head... I, I can't it, imagine. It's, it's probably somewhat accurate no. to it. Hold on, did you say you wanted to talk about this topic, or was, or did I misremember that? No, I mean, I, I, I want to talk about it. Okay, um, it's just kind of, it, it, it's a little obscure, I guess you might say. We, um, like, we, we take those, it's always good it, to have it, an obscure it's an older game too. It's about five years old at this point, I think. Yeah, I think it, it came out, I think, somewhere in the middle of the 3DS's lifespan. Yeah. Striking while the iron's frigid cold, that's yeah. how we do it. I, um, I have the game too, and I've played, I, I don't think I've, played nearly as much as Bradley did, but I played it a, a good bit. Yeah. So tell me more about it. I wanted to I wanted to pull out my 3DS to check the play times I had, and on my initial first file, I had a little over 200 hours. Jesus Christ. Um, oh. And on my on my second one, where I decided to speed through it a little bit more, I had about 70. Damn. Um, and realistically, you could beat the main story in like four or five hours. There's just so much fun stuff to do. Yeah. Um, I think the most unique thing about the game are the the lives, which is what they call the classes in this game. Uh, because, you know, they, they have like your standard, like, oh, you can be a warrior, you can be a paladin, you can be a mage, Ooh. you can be a hunter, stuff like that. Um, but I was really interested when I saw you could also choose to be stuff like a chef or an angler or a tailor yeah. or a carpenter. Um, and I was like, well, that sounds like it kind of sucks because I'm going to have to fight for the main story at some point, right? Like, I feel like I'm at a huge disadvantage. Like, if I pick Angler, I'm going to fish for 10 hours and then I get to a boss fight. Do I have to go train warrior skills for 10 hours? And it's really interesting because they designed the game so that any, like, class you choose is just as viable for leveling up in combat as any others. So... Like, if you fished for, if you just fished from the start of the game for 10 hours and someone else was out doing like paladin shit, um, you guys would 
probably potentially be at the same level and could d accomplish whatever story mission you needed to. Um, because like the kind of experience you get for like making furniture or making clothes or fishing is the same kind of experience you get from killing enemies and then you can divvy out the points however you want. Um, it's really interesting. I really like the art style. It's kind of cutesy, I guess. Um, <laughs> Perfect Brad art, art style. Oh, it really is. And uh, <laughs> I, like I, think, I think every character in the game is likable. That's just me. Um, very interesting. Uh, I'd say take a look at some gameplay. Take a look at the classes. Um, it's a good game. Yeah. Uh, Dust off that 3DS. Yeah. yeah. I'll, it's funny because I like the game. I wanted to play it more, but I felt like what hindered it was I was on the 3DS. So like, yeah. it was a psychological thing for me where I would only play it when I was traveling or in a plane or waiting for something to happen. And now you got the Switch for that, which has way better games. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, just let me squeeze in. I, I wiped off my 3DS recently to start playing Persona Q because uh, I couldn't wait right. for Q2. So that, that's been – that game's fucking hard. I'll talk about it at a later date. <laughs> man, that, the music in Q2, man. The music that we've heard, holy shit. <laughs> Can't wait. Um, Bradley, is that all you got for Fantasy Life? Uh, I think that's all there's to say right now about Fantasy Life. Uh, well, it's one of my favorite 3DS games. I think more people should know about it. If it's cheap, I might check. I really like the idea of being a weird I'm, I'm, class, so I might check it out. I'm sure it's cheap. It's done by level yeah. five games. You could probably oh, get what it. What else do they do? They do um, they do like another pretty like niche but kind of popular series that I can't remember. Yeah. Joe, why you look that up, Bradley? Yeah, level five. Yeah. They oh, did, they, they so they do yokai of... watch. Okay. Oh, and Nino Kunai. Another, yeah. another so small game. They, they know their shit. All is all I'm saying. I've been I've been wanting to try I, out a, a, a yokai watch. Do they do Professor Layton? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, oh, I, lo I love this place's art style. Okay. Bradley, this week, or last week, you, yeah. like, on a whim, just decided to go into the VR land, go yeah. into the give-up machines, as I call them, to tell us about your VR adventures. I was going to use the exact same phrasing. On a whim is correct. Um, it's so random. I think what initially happened is I was on, like, the Switch news page, and... Uh, I saw like the Nintendo Labo headset, which I'm probably the only person in the world who bought it. But I was like, you know what? I'm 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 Nintendo fanboy. I'll, yes. I'll go buy it. I'll try yes, it out. You got to support Nintendo, man. It's starving. It's it's failing real bad. <laughs> you got to purchase every bit you can. I gotta buy it. Um, so I got the Nintendo Labo headset. Uh, I had fun putting it together. So I guess I'm five. Yes. Uh, Confirmed. In... It comes with a little small suite of games um, that were just kind of fun to mess around with. Um, it's not spectacular, but it's probably the best VR experience you'll get for $40, if that says anything about it. Um, but it inspired me to go pick up PSVR. Um, how, how, much was on uh, how much was it on sale for these days? Um, I think I got the PlayStation VR and any additional accessories or games I wanted for about $400. Okay. Um, okay. Which... There was, a, there was a point there where the VR was like 200 That, that would have been nice to snag. Yeah. Um, overall, it was cheaper than me, you know, building like a really good PC of and course. getting o Oculus and all that shit. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm good with it. Um, and man, it's really cool. Uh, <laughs> I've mostly played the... Um, I think the most well-known VR game is probably that Job Simulator. Mm -hmm. um, really it, it, it's just like that comedic little yeah. like office game, which I had a, I had a blast playing it. It's, um, yeah. But man, VR Skyrim, I'm calling it now. <laughs> it's, the, it's the definitive way to experience that game. Damn, after 15 releases, we got it, guys. We got like, the real one. It's not the I, fridge. It's not the mason jar. It's not Amazon. It's not not the oven light you have it's not the flip-flop it's not the edge sketch nope because i'm like this is a game where you know I, i've made like a million new files hundreds of hours in this game and you know i i can i can just play it over and over again personally but playing it in vr was just something else like you don't really get like the scale of some of these objects in relation to your character um but the moment that like really sold it for me 
was the opening scene in Helgen when that dragon first Ooh. comes down. You know, I've seen it a million times. I knew it was coming, and I flinched so hard I almost fell over. That's dumb. And even the tiniest, like, least threatening enemies in the game, like regular wolves and the giant rats, skeevers or whatever, like, when they jump at your face, it's terrifying. And, <laughs> like, shooting flames out of your hands both feels awesome and also scary because you're like, holy shit, fire's scary. <laughs> um... <laughs> I God, I like it. And I find myself being much more of a lawful good in this playthrough than I normally am because it's a lot harder to be horrible to someone when you're looking right at them. That's so interesting. Um, So, man, I think it's really cool. If I had one complaint, it's that I think PSVR is supposed to be a lot less high res than like Oculus is or something. Um, it looks pretty nice, but... Um, if you look really hard, you can see kind of the pixelation and stuff. No, um, part of that might also be how old Skyrim is, potentially. Yeah, it might be. Um, sometimes my eyes are strained a little bit, and I think I described it to you guys as... I don't wear glasses, but it's what I imagine someone who needs glasses would see. It's like... Yeah. I, I can like I can read text if it's like really big, but some of the smaller there, text on like the game, I have to get close. Um, what was overall, I think it's pretty dope. I I said like it's a bit of blur whenever you like get to certain mm. spots and trying to read things. Yeah. I've I never like, I've never tried PSVR or any VR for any long capacity really. I, if if you want, if, if I could venture a, a quick just topic yeah. discussion, I have the Oculus and I, I don't know what version of the Oculus. Oculus it is. Reparo. Hmm. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> It was a Harry uh, Potter thing. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I had I got the Oculus one year for Christmas and I really enjoyed it. Um, and but like after and I've played, oh god, I've probably put close to like thirty or forty hours into it. I think, um, and I would love to put more into VR and playing VR because there's nothing like playing a game in VR. I feel, um, uh, like it's it's just it's a. a, a cool and unique experience like there was we went to a an arcade in austin called pinballs mm -hmm. and we bradley i don't think you were part of it but we went in wait were you when yeah we did the i VR? i was yeah, the yeah, one who didn't did. get to do it okay yeah i think and it was you then, me tyler and laura yeah and we did the vr thing and man that like we were i think we were in there for like 30 or 20 minutes but it felt like it just flew by we yeah, could hear you like, guys yelling it was it very was like funny color, it was like basically like Call of Duty Nazi zombies, um, but VR and man. And, and well, like if, it was in an eight-way treadmill too, so like that's yeah. the important part. You had full movement of your character, right? Yeah, that, and that and I agree. And and so like, if and like if you took that game and you gave someone a controller and you're like, all right, play this game, they'd be like, ah, oh, this is a five out of ten game, I guess, because you get to shoot things. But the ability of you to hold on, like to hold on to your pistols. And just shoot wherever you want and not be constrained by like like analog sticks or anything like that. It's it's such a blast. Oh yeah. Um, but like immediately there are there are two things about VR that um that that's immediately like why it will never or why it will take several more years for VR to like actually be a thing in the home. Let's number hear it. one number one being is costs. Um, a VR headset isn't a six hundred dollar buy. It's a twenty six hundred dollar buy. Yeah, you have to buy a very good high end computer. Jesus. Um, and computer parts are just getting more expensive, and you have to buy the headset. So I that's, think that's why the PSVR has been kind of doing better than yeah, most. Right. Yeah. I was like, that's the biggest bang from my book. I just realized there's actually three things. Uh, the second thing is space. Um, if you have VR, you have to have a very designated space to play the game in because it, it's sensor based and it, it deals with a lot of movement and it kind of needs to register where you're looking at all times. And if you don't have enough sensors or the room's not big enough, it can kind of it can really detract from the experience of playing these games. Yeah, I think if my living room was like even a tiny bit Bigger. smaller i you're wouldn't smaller. i wouldn't really be able to play yeah like your room the, your living room brad like if you move that coffee table it's like the perfect it's like just the right size for yeah you. um my office is is just a bit too small for vr which is why i don't like having it set up 
in addition to the there's not a good place to put my sensors on to use them um so that's number two the number three thing is it can get exhausting to play vr Mm -hmm. like just just kind of like flailing around everywhere and just like the eyesore and it's like a weird kind of more of a health hazard than playing regular games is because you have this screen that's literally in your face like i'll say i got a i got a break at about the like 45 minute or an hour point yeah and and i have a game i have a game super hot that game is a 10 out of 10 vr game like holy shit is that game fun in vr um but god damn i played that game for an hour and i looked like i jumped into a pool <laughs> it doesn't and, help and, that it has like a weird art style too yeah and and like so so like that that's not necessarily a bad thing having movement but what it does is it makes the the vr headset very niche and that you either have a game that is full movement where you're moving around everywhere or you have a game that you are just sitting in a chair and you're not really and you're just kind of more or less at a computer desk playing a game yeah kind of deal. like you're flying a spaceship like there's no kind of in between i feel and there's no like um I, vr skyrim is a, it, there's it, none none of these games feel like a game that i would actually sit down and play they feel like games that i would play for a while and, and kind of do for a bit and then that's it there, there's no games out currently that i can really get invested in well okay so this yeah. is the last thing i wanted to say is that bradley next time we get a chance at your place because you have the vr headset i would like to bring my playstation so we can play resident evil 7 in vr yes because that game not only is it just a great game i've heard such good things about the vr experience i feel like i would love to see bradley just kind of squirm and all the little <laughs> VR bullshit that happens in Resident right. Evil Seven. Uh, I that that was. The I other feel like that, that's the standout game. Yeah, I think I think VR Skyrim and VR Resident Evil Seven are like the only two big games that are like game games and have a real big experience playing them. But everything else is feels very, very gimmicky. Yeah, that's the thing, gimmicky. Because like, I talked about how much I like VR Skyrim and like Job Simulator and stuff. But the thing is, like, whenever I'm playing them. If you asked me what I was doing, I wouldn't say I'm playing a game. I'd say I'm playing a VR game. Like, Ew. I, I feel like it, it's still it's still so niche that it kind of requires like that qualifier. So uh, The only one that really didn't feel like a tech demo and felt like a really good VR game is Keep Talking Nobody Explodes. Oh, my God. And, uh, and another game called I Want You to Die, which is like an escape room puzzle game. But that game is like really short and kind of like, oh, all right. And you, you really can't replay it, which is really sad because it's got some great ideas and thought put into it. There's that Iron Man VR game coming out that I uh, people that saw the trailers and like the actual footage, they seem pretty, pretty happy with. So maybe that'll be cool. Yeah. All yeah. right. VR we got anything else for VR talk? Uh, we're actually going to talk about Pathway now. Um, Pathway. I'll, I'll talk first because I got almost nothing to say. I played a little bit of this game. Uh, didn't fall in love with it, but I do need to give it more uh, more time. So that's where I'm at with it. Let me, let me check my playtime on this and see if I feel comfortable. Because I feel like I, I feel comfortable giving my overall final time. review. Yeah. Um, so... Uh... Uh, Pathway is a game by that's published by Chucklefish and was developed by give me a second. It is only on Steam, no Switch. It's only on Steam. It was it was developed by Robot Robo Robotality and was published by Chucklefish. Um the game is essentially a darkest dungeon esque XCOM like uh game where you pick an adventure, you pick your initial team and you move around them like you go turn by turn to different spaces on the map and you eventually have to do these uh turn based squad tactic uh fights as well as having some like uh D esque like adventure choices yeah i know at least for joe and i and i think maybe willer like the second we saw the trailer we're like oh hell yeah i'm buying this yeah i i, I was like oh this is a game right up my alley uh, it's $16. It's super cheap. 
so that that's real nice and i'm glad sixteen dollars i think is the appropriate price for this game yeah yeah I, I feel like that's accurate and man let me just say pick the pixel art in this game deluxe very good very good very art. good pixel art. I like the colors the art in this game is really is really good um so so i'm just i'm gonna run through my goods real quick um i feel like the, the game has a great theme and setting to it it's a really cool idea uh, I really like that after that your characters carry over XP from missions, both success and failure. So you kind of yes. have this continuous I, I like that. Yeah. level up system. Um, I feel like it's pretty challenging, which I think is is a good thing. Uh, yeah, I, like you said, it almost becomes a resource management in a way, like managing uh, your fuel to get around the map, um, mm -hmm. your health items, ammo, stuff like that. It, it's a it's very roguelite ish. Yeah. Um. So so I really I really like that aspect. Um. As as for negatives, I feel like this game has a lot of potential and falls just short, which is kind of upsetting. Yeah, um, I I, I agree. Yeah. Um, and the reason I think that is because. You know, as you go on, while you will, you know, find new weapons, unlock new characters, you go into new campaigns, you know, you see new maps, see new enemy types, but mm -hmm. despite all that, I feel like in the first hour or two of the game, in a way, you've kind of seen everything the game has to offer. That's, that's the problem I had. I, I felt yeah. that. And I, I agree. And I was kind of really disappointed because you, you go through the first mission. The first mission is just like one map. And it's really short, and so I was like, okay. And I had to play it two or three times to actually beat it. I was like, okay, I, I have an yeah. idea what the, this game will be, and I think this is a good first starting mission. And then I I did the second mission, and it took me about five or six times. And I got to the end, I was like, I was like, that was just the first mission, but, but three times as long. Yeah. Mm. And and to me, that was a pretty bad sign. And I started the third mission, and it felt the same with a different enemy type popping up more frequently maybe just maybe the fifth or fourth or whatever the last one is i, I makes... mean maybe i haven't been able to get that far because once again this game is pretty hard and big, big and, maybe yeah um but i think i think after like that second one usually like by the second level of games like these you have a good indication of where this game's gonna go yeah um and i feel like one of the big complaints i have about this game is um is what i like to call like battlefield dynamics um so i'm a big like war gaming kind i'm a big war game person like i, I play Warhammer 40,000. i do miniature games i've played a bunch of xcom and stuff like that joe and loves so, war i i god if we could just send everybody to war to play some yeah games, <laughs> be a better place um so so when you when you play war games like you know your initial appeal is like oh i get to be this dude and i get to go off and i get to blow up these tanks and destroy these things and have this like you you have like that's the original appeal is you have a thing that can be another thing essentially i get to blow up aliens i get to blow up tanks i get to uh you know punch nazis you like you 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 have it the action is fun and you like the tactical aspect of like having to like flank and do all these different components to take down different things you have to do to take down your opponents you know that's good and fun but what happens is when you spend enough time with the game you eventually figure out a a strategy that is very good and efficient and you just stick to that strategy for the rest of the game because you know you can just take down anybody with this strategy um so to combat that what needs to happen is you have to throw in you have to throw in an objective or a an event that shakes up the way you ac approach a situation. Um, XCOM 2 does this the best, I feel. Um, I could talk about XCOM 2 for days, but essentially what XCOM 2 is compared to XCOM 1, XCOM 1 had a lot of missions that were like, go in, eliminate all enemy forces, and then leave. Like, that was, that was all the missions, basically. Um, in XCOM 2, most of the missions are like you have 20 turns to find a host, find the hostage, get the hostage to the drop-off location, and get your entire squad to the drop-off location to survive. Or you have to stop this specific target from getting to point A to point B within this time limit. 
or you have to, you know, disarm all the bombs on the map. Like there, you have when you went into a situation or a mission, you had to think really think about how am I approaching this situation. And and in Pathfind, Pathfinder in Pathway, you don't get that. Every mission is, oh no, you stumbled across Nazis, kill the Nazis. Oh no, you stumbled across zombies, kill the zombies. And and it's just over and over and over again to the point where it's just like, it's not fun to play because you're just doing the same thing over again. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't even realize that was what my problem with the combat was because I noticed that, like, I noticed at some point in Mission 2 that, like, kind of my general formula was as soon as the battle starts, I hide my guys until the enemies find me and then I stab them to death because they're <laughs> close by now. Yeah. Um, Like, the enemy AI isn't spectacular and like you said there's no like special objectives for each fight to mix things up it's just you know kill all the other guys so and, and uh, like, it, it's not even like um there has to be some sort of like get the flag it there just needs to be something that puts urgency on the player to engage the enemy yeah. and that's not pre pre that's not in shown in any of the different battles you do it's just like fight the dudes and then you fight the dudes and that's it so hopefully you pathway i think it's worth 16 dollars, but i don't think it's worth more than 16 dollars. the yeah. deal with pathway i feel like is that it's gonna make I, I won't feel bad about its purchase after like a year where more content is added um i feel like this is a game that can still be saved by uh mm -hmm. different content and uh new missions and new yeah. events and stuff I think so. and I think like another thing that'd be really cool is so like in the game you have all these different characters you can unlock and they have different stats and abilities and uh, I think it would be really cool that you had a character maker where you got like you have a point total and you have to you get the like average out your stats and you can dress them up and you can level them up as the game goes on like it feels like it's missing that component as well which makes it really kind of unique for your playthrough um but yeah I I give it a solid six out of ten. Uh, I'll we, give it a. We I'll doing six ten point scales now? <laughs> I, that, that's just what I think about it. I give it a two out, of, two point five out of five. Yeah, Ooh. it has a ton of potential. Uh, it just needs to execute. All right, I definitely agree. Ooh. That's pathway. Hopefully, cool stuff gets added. Great games. Cokefish has been publishing some good. They they are the publisher for spiritual su successors. Man, that mother three successor, man, Bradley. Ooh. I don't. I, I mean, don't know, we man. got the we got the Advance War successor. We got the Harvest Moon successor. So uh, I know there's a few more in there. So and and to bring up Advance Wars real quick, or the the War Groove. Yeah. Um, that game. Every mission is destroy the enemy barracks or or destroy the enemy captain but what makes it different is that there's the there, there's a lot of other elements going on in the battlefield that makes each encounter or each battle interesting actually yeah. there's also some missions where it's like i you got to get your guy to a certain point yeah that that too like get the you have to um get the transport villagers across the map or whatever like, there's some variance to it um, and, and but even in multiplayer missions, like you know, each commander is different. Um, there's there's different. The maps are different. It's it, it just every there's enough difference there to make each each encounter unique. But yeah. Okay. So final topic. Um. Uh, will be worm, which I read one more chapter. I wanted to do one more, but time forbade it. Uh. Uh, it'll make Bradley very happy to hear that I actually really, really liked um, this last chapter I read. Uh, and was this 10.5 or 10.6? This was 10.6. It was the last Ooh. chapter in, <laughs> in Arc 10. Um, arc 10 has, in general, been... I think it's my favorite arc uh, so far. Uh, especially after Arc 9, which was featuring a lot of characters I didn't care about. But I retroactively care about them now that we got an arc where we're like just fighting them. That that was an interesting case because I felt like the action had a little more weight. Um, speaking of action, this whole chapter was an escape sequence, which 
I've gone on record to say that I find the action in Worm to be lackluster a lot of the time, where there's a lot of time where what's happening isn't very interesting. I prefer the big play moments with uh, abilities. Um, but Taylor's been showing some really cool abilities with her, with her bugs. She's definitely leveled up uh, her skill set, so to say. Which uh, Pulling out some new tricks. Uh, yeah, she started... Uh, last chapter, she did that cool thing where she mentioned how she coated her bugs in a a something to coat them so she could get like a little bit of pepper spray on her bugs how did that work again bradley you surely you know you know all the things yeah she she wanted to coat her bugs in uh i think it's pronounced capsaicin which is like the active ingredient in pepper spray um most of the types of bugs would die um and she was able to find a way to like coat their stingers and something that would make the capsaicin not kill them. Um, so now when you get stung by thousands of wasps, um, you're also getting pepper, pepper spray in the wounds. Really cool. Um, I like that progression in her. She's quickly become someone who's terrifying. Like if, if I was to fight Skitter, as she's called in this in this book, uh, slash web serial, uh, that would suck. She controls oh. a bunch of bugs. Uh, which hasn't come up yet, <laughs> but that's her power, and it, she's kind of fucking terrifying, and she's the yeah, main character. Yeah, if, uh, if I was in that city and I saw a bug, I would just kind of put my hands up. <laughs> they could all be carrying guns for all you know. She could do it. Yeah. Um, so 10.6 is uh, a chapter I've reread many times. I feel like kind of the first half of the chapter we get a really we, we get a really good character moment and the second half of the chapter is like big plot moments right so i was talking about the action um i have problems with the action in worm but i think it's more of a medium problem where i feel if you're not doing anything uh big and if you're not doing big play action i feel like in books you you lose some I think it's a medium that's not as good for that. Like, if you're saying, oh, he throws an elbow and then he throws a punch, it's... With- yeah, I, I, I agree. Unless there's, uh, like, some sort of dynamic that's happening, like, mm-hmm. the, like that's a actual, like, oh, I need th- th- I need to get this thing. I, I feel like action is very boring to read in books. I, I totally agree. Um, yeah. Which a, a solid thirty to forty percent of Worm action is pretty basic, very because gr- Worm is a really grounded series. Um, yeah, a lot of the action's very gritty and realistic, and it doesn't get wacky. Um, it could stand to get a little wacky, but it's not that kind of series, right? So when there's a lot of parries and and the blows thrown, and they're just kind of physical, I swing my baton at her, but she ducked. Then she used her power. Um, a solid 30 to 40, maybe even more, of all of Worm's action is that. And to me, it's not that interesting. But this arc was a chase sequence, which I think is inherently better for the medium of a book. Because you're trying to get to the exit. There's all sorts of obstacles. Um, you can very clearly picture and get a feel for the how tense the situation is growing. I think that's a big part of it. You can feel the tension as more and more pathways and obstacles start getting cleared. Uh, in this chapter, they're getting chased by a hero called Dragon, who's in a giant mech suit. Um, and has all sorts of tools to kind of cage them in. They're escaping a certain base. And it's just, it was really good. I, I enjoy that. Um, but... What I really liked was near the end, where you were t- talking about big plot things. Uh, Ooh. Where fucking bitch, man. There, there's a character called Bitch, and she was a real bitch this this chapter. Where, in the back of my mind, I guess I had the wrong impression, where I was like, Bitch is mean, but she kind of likes Taylor. She's had bonding moments with her. Uh, I, I, I thought that, like, she has a soft spot for her, even though... Things have been bad with the group lately, so I was like, yeah. okay, this, this is probably why. I, I can see why she's hurt. That's the thing, is Bitch almost certainly did have a soft spot for Taylor before she found out that, you know, Taylor was going to... Betray everyone. Betray all of them. So. Um, this came as... A, I didn't know it was that severe to where Bitch throws Taylor into, like, a, a vat of... The sticky substance, this foam that the heroes yeah. use to trap people. And, and I love the reveal of that particular moment because yes. 
Taylor and Bitch are both trying to get away from Dragon in this pile of containment foam. Um, and Taylor's like, something huge kind of knocked me off my stance and I fell into the foam. And then she just kind of assumed it was Dragon. And then a few paragraphs later, she looks up and sees, she sees Bitch right off. And she's like, it wasn't Bef Dragon who knocked me into the foam. Before that, Bitch gives her like a look. And she's like, the look is all I needed. Just seeing her eyes behind her mask was all I needed to see what would actually happen um i want to know where that goes uh and uh the mech suit opens up to reveal a weird fetus thing inside of it which what the fuck <laughs> i yeah. uh i have no idea what that is in implying or entailing but i'm interested to see i'll say that's a very uh that's that's a very crazy moment also uh, <laughs> go go on no no why go ahead it's just so weird because um, you get all this weird it's stuff. A fetus. Like, it's, That's why it's weird. It's a, yeah. It's, like, it's Joe. It's a fetus in a mech suit, which is not like anything so far in this it's series. Like, the only other time we've seen dragon parentheses in person is a mech suit. A mech suit showed up to the Leviathan fight. Yeah, and I think it got totally destroyed, so she wasn't in there. I guess it was remote controlled, and when but this I... mech suit showed up. Uh, Tattletail's like, oh, this one's remote controlled, and Regent's like, no, there's a there's, there's, a, a, there's, there's something in there. there. Yeah. Um, and then it gets broken open, and you see this fetus in there, and you're like, what the fuck is Dragon? And like, Tinkers have specialties, and you kind of have to wonder what the fuck is their specialty. That's one thing I have to complain about Tinkers. Like, it's hard to tell what their specialties are because, like, kid win the fucking loser which he's not that bad but <laughs> he just makes whatever and i feel like all of them just make all sorts of stuff i i wish it was a little more specialized but yeah uh, i guess there's some kind of loose interpretations in there i'm sure i'm gonna run into some that are like i can only make freeze rays and i i think i'll enjoy that more yeah um so uh, then what happens after that 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 was like the end she oh what happens she lets her go which i thought was really confusing and I, I didn't really get what she was saying or talking about. Her suit gets blown up because there was like a lightning gun going crazy, right? Yeah. And and she was like she was aware that it was about to blow up. So she lets Taylor go before it blows up. And she indeed does. And uh, I think your question will be answered. Okay. Uh, I'm not relatively... so, I'm not supposed to know yet, right? Uh no, I don't no think fun. you would have any idea why she would let Taylor go in that no situation. No idea. Okay, that was uh, that was solid four point five out of five. And then five. the end of ten point six kind of has a little. Um, it kind of has a little. I say little. It's more of a big. Um, kind of. I guess you could call it exposition. We get info on a group of people called the Slaughterhouse Nine. No, we don't. In ten point six, we do rather. N no. Um, do we? You read ten point five then. Oh no. Ah, uh, wait. Are you sure? So ten point I it, so it wasn't ten point six, it was ten point five. Yeah, you read ten point five. But you got confused. You said you read ten point six a lot. Whatever. Yeah, okay. I reread ten point six a lot. I thought that's the one you read. Well, I lied. <laughs> well, okay. I'm gonna ten point five is good though, apparently. Allegedly. Allegedly. Uh I gave it a four point five out of five. Damn, it's, all right. I'll take it's it. probably my favorite little chapter in Worm so far. Very good. And yeah, that's the Worm talk for now. Joe is probably very confused. He has no context. <laughs> Get out of here. Worm? And in fact, any any listener would have no context because we started this and I'm a eight big arcs into the series. So, I mean, yeah. that's just this is just for the 12 Worm fans out there. A four. Again, I underestimated how much Willer would like this chapter, which I've done for every chapter in this arc so far. Good. It's been a good arc. Right. This arc good uh, reinvigorated, like, okay, I'm not wasting my time here. Because uh, as I said, the plot and the mystery, I, I might not be connecting with the characters or the action, but I'm, I'm definitely starting to get really into the plot and the mystery. So, yeah. All right. Well... Uh, is that all that's on the docket? That's all that's on the docket. Bradley, won't you gracefully send us off? Oh, shit. I didn't think of one. Hold up. Um, Got him. Okay. Okay. So you go, you're at home, right? Yeah. yeah. You're at home and you go outside 
uh, you're going to go grocery shopping. But Ash Ketchum and his Pikachu are there, right? Uh huh. And At so, the grocery store? Uh, right there. no, just outside your house. Okay. okay. And so, Ash Ketchum, um, he pulls out his Pokedex and he's like, Dex, what is it? And it's like, uh, it's Willer, the <laughs> Willer Pokemon. Um, and so Ash flips his cap around, he pulls out a Pokeball, and he's going to catch you, and he orders Pikachu to attack you. And you try to tell him, no, wait, no, I'm a person, I'm not a Pokemon, but all that comes out of your mouth is your name. <laughs> uh, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to fight? Are you going to run? You gonna, what, 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 what are you going to do? Wait, so hold on. I was always a Pokemon, but I didn't know? Uh, or did I become a Pokemon through some weird... The ability. No, like, was Ash Ketchum got cryogenically frozen, and we what? evolved no, we didn't. From Pokemon, became an advanced society, but we still have Pokemon DNA in us. The Pokedex thinks you're a Pokemon. That's the scenario. But why that, am I just saying Willer, Willer, Willer? The scenario is that um, you're still you in every way. It's just Ash thinks you're a Pokemon, and then for some reason you can only say your name right now. That doesn't. I would rather <laughs> you, you tell me. Do? I. Gonna, I would rather you. <laughs> I would rather you tell me I became a Pokemon. That makes more sense to me. Are you going to fight Pikachu? Are you going to get caught by Ash? Uh, is this early season Pikachu or late season Pikachu? Because he resets each time. Uh, this is like mid-season. He knows like Iron Tail and Electro Blast or some shit. Is he currently learning like the season big move? that He, he like learns a big move each season? Uh, yeah, Ash is trying to get Pikachu stronger and he's going to okay. battle you to do it. Uh... I'm gonna get caught by Ash um, because he'll release me because he's a fucking dumbass. So, <laughs> Joe, you gonna fight Pikachu? Uh, so I, I get down my stance. I uh, yell Joe, and then uh, let's, let's, let's strike a pose because it's actually just JoJo's the entire time. Oh, <laughs> and then I mean, Pikachu use use Electro Smash. That I died. That was yeah. a good role play, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> I died. <laughs> well, there we go. That 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 there you have it. That was episode four. Let us know what you cast. would do in the comments. Yeah, send us emails at uh, at roundaboutcast. No, the roundaboutcast at gmail.com. Yeah, no the email now. Let's say it then. The roundaboutcast at gmail.com. Hey. Alright, bye bye.